So welcome to the talk on um, bot, uh, which is how I ended up, I should not walk here, how I ended up naming um, the software which is able to um, bootstrap Debian-based operating systems from scratch um, just by doing a dependency analysis. Um, bot is short for bootstrap or built ordering toolchain. It started as a Debian Google Summer of Code project in 2012 and uh, was continued uh, as my master thesis at Jacobs University Bremen. Um, in the end, I give some links to where you can download that if you are more interested. My mentors during the Google Summer of Code as well the time afterwards were Wookie and Pietra Batte, um, where Wookie provided me with the practical set of things, how cross-building and bootstrapping is actually done, and um, Pietro uh, of, um, with all the theoretical and um, academic stuff that is, was needed to go through all of that. Um, so how does it work in Debian? We all know that in the common case, source packages are always native to compiled. And uh, they are compiled with the knowledge that they, can, they have access to the full archive of binary packages. And that is not the case during bootstrapping, where some core must be cross-compiled. And only few binary packages are available initially, which means you run into dependency cycles. Um, because you need a binary package built by a source package A, which uh, can't be built because it needs some package by uh, a source package B, which can't be built because it needs something from A. Um, in fact, you don't run into dependency cycles as much as you run into strongly connected components, which is the part of a graph where all vertices that are um, part of the strongly connected component, or SCC, um, are in a cycle with each other. And those things can be pretty huge, like that one, which is how it looks right now. And every time um, Debian uh, is to be ported, uh, somebody has to solve that by hand. Um, it's called a hairball, and which makes sense because it looks pretty bad. And that one uh, particularly has uh, only a thousand nodes and a few 10,000 edges. Um, another thing we can uh, harvest from uh, uh, snapshotdebian.org is this graph. On the y-axis, it shows the number of vertices in this biggest strongly connected component, which I showed before. And the um, x-axis shows the time in years. And we can see that uh, the problem size, um, the size of the biggest SCC grows over time. As software becomes more and more complex, um, it depends on more and more things, and uh, that produces more and more cycles in the base packages. Yes? Like what is in, in, uh, contained in it? Yeah. Um, well, the structure of the dependency graph for Debian and any or Ubuntu for that matter, um, yeah, so most Debian-based distributions throughout all that time is there is one big SCC which is of that size and several like 10 or 12 smaller ones um, that don't go above size of 6 or 8. The biggest one contains all the um, interesting stuff like uh, browsers, email clients, uh, GTK, GNOME, everything, because some package just depends on some GNOME thing, but to build that, you need the rest of GNOME, so you end up with that. Um, the full list is on one of the links, which I show in later slides, so you can have a look and see what's all inside. There's Firefox and Thunderbird and half of KDE and all well, that kind of funny things. Another funny thing is um, once you have that built, so once this big thing is solved, um, the rest is practically a linear build order. So once that is done, the rest is simple, apart from those small cases like um, some Haskell stuff and so on. Yes? Um, it looks like it's going down again at the end. Is that real? Or? I don't know how to interpret that, but that's the data. So um, yes, it is real. Um, so it uh, apparently, that's Debian SID. So, um, apparently it's going down. For some reason or the other, I didn't uh, invest, uh, invest time looking on why some certain jumps happen or not. Um, but generally, there seems, seems to be an upward trend, which also seems to make sense, given the complexity argument. Right, so the current bootstrapping practice is that uh, people use GAN to open embed it to avoid the cross-compilation, because that's not working very well right now, and uh, build a minimal system to compile on, do dependency analysis manually. So I heard from people that they were doing that kind of stuff on paper and drawing that. Uh, and then um, after finding those cycles or finding stuff that doesn't build uh, or only misses things, to manually hack source packages so that they can build 
with less build dependencies that they would normally need and thus break dependency cycles. Um, and that takes loads of time and the goal of the Google Summer of Code last year was to have that automated to avoid that to be done repeatedly every time a port is done. So what would happen, what could we have if bootstrapping was easier? The most obvious thing is that porting for upcoming architectures would of course be easier. We could also see more custom ports optimized for a specific CPU. Um, so that the again to argument that, well, you don't, you don't have it as optimized for that CPU as we can um, would go away because it would be easier to have Debian optimized for a certain thing. It would remove the need of GAN to open better and make Debian more universal because it would be able to bootstrap itself without needing anything else. But there is more. You can use it to update lagging architectures, um, creating the build order for that. Build for targets that can't build themselves once cross-building works better. You, can have a QA you could have a QA tool which allows to check the archive regularly for bootstrapability. <coughs> and um, you can uh, also use it to order library transitions which include cycles like for Haskell or a Camel, that's currently done using Ben, and, um, but Ben can't handle cycles, so for example, if you look at the Ben transition output for Haskell, it's uh, all garbled because it includes it's cycles. Hmm? Ah, right, that's great. Right, um, so the essence of this talk is that the core algorithms for the graph analysis necessary exist, and they are fast, and they seem to be correct from just looking at it, but we need decisions about the new dependency syntaxes, the multi-art and cross-building, to the practical plumbing and to try it on in practice, which is part of what is being done in a Google Sum of Code project by Alkman this year. So the tools which I ended up writing are written in OCaml mainly, and there are a couple of Python and shell scripts to put them all together. It's all LGPL3. It's using Dozer 3 as a helper library for the parser and solver, like it's a real solver, not um, like it will find a solution if there exists one, unlike apt. Um, the tools follow the Unix philosophy, so um, there are access multiple applications, each executing one algorithm, and they're all connected by pipes using Debian package description format, like the um, Deb H22 format, as an exchange format. And the graphs that are generated are in GraphML so that you can uh, easily write a tool that consumes them and does other stuff with it. And it's all in Git at the URL, which you see there. So more specifically, um, you can now create a dependency graph. You can analyze it using several different methods, and you use these methods to find source packages to modify to make um, Debian bootstrappable. And uh, after you've done that and you um, modified enough source packages, uh, it allows you to create a build order from the then acyclic graph. An important thing to mention is that it's all theory. So at no point um, I am compiling packages or um, installing packages. Um, it only works on the metadata. So it's only um, using packages and sources files and input and assumes that um, if dependencies are satisfied, then I can build it, which of course uh, hides loads of things that can don't go wrong in practice, especially when a port for new architecture is done. Um, but well, that's what's being done so far. So what is needed in practice to make it all work is that um, Debian has some sort of reduced build dependencies or build profiles, which we call them now, and that cross-compilation for at least the base packages works. The bootstrap workflow would be to first select binaries for minimal build system and cross-compile them. This, um, of course, again, is its own task of uh, breaking dependency cycles, but it turned out, at least for um, Ubuntu, as far as uh, Wookie said, to be um, rather easy and not involve much um, dependency analysis. Sorry, what is um, <laughs> if you, if you cross If you cross-build a, a small um, base system, then... Uh, it doesn't in, it's not necessary to go into full graph analysis mode. and Exactly. And then you have your base system, which you can use to start compilation. So in the rest of the talk, I just assume that we are doing native compilation and have magically from a box the um, minimal build system, just including um, essential packages and um, um, build essential. So from that, you create a uh, build graph. Ah, I had needed to change that, so build graph is a special term which I wanted to avoid. So create a, you create a graph and extract strongly connected components, and you analyze them using uh, some heuristics to find source packages to add build profiles to. 
you modify them and go back to two until the graph is cycle free, then um, the algorithm selects the source packages to be profile built, makes the graph acyclic, and gives you a build order. Um, so far, so good. Um, the hard part is to break those dependency cycles. Um, and uh, that can be done in multiple ways. And the most obvious is, of course, to use um, build profiles and to use them to build source packages with uh, less build dependencies than they would otherwise use. Another very helpful thing is uh, build depends in depth. So if um, your source package, source package depends on stuff which could go to build depends in depth, then that would be helpful for bootstrapping. Because during bootstrapping, you of course don't rebuild the architecture all packages. So you can um, ignore the build depends in depth list. Um, another method is to choose different, different installation sets for non strong dependencies. Uh, it means to um, not install, like, Package dependencies have disjunctions, so you can uh, satisfy dependencies using different sets. So um, sometimes one set is hard to bootstrap and the other one would be easy, so that means just choosing another, another set. Uh, another one would be to um, make binary packages available through cross-compilation. So uh, once you're stuck and the other things don't work, cross-compilation might come to the rescue and give you some binary package which um, solves your cycle. You can, you, you can maybe use existing multi-arch foreign packages, so maybe your New architecture allows you to run stuff from an architecture that already exists and can help you to satisfy stuff and break cycles through that. Or splitting source packages um, in a way such that um, they are split in the part which others depend upon, another part which depends on other things, which would again um, break cycles. Yes. Packages. Yes, I'm not sure whether that would work or if that would be useful at all, just from a theoretical point of view. So you'd right. tell me. I, I, I'm a bit confused um, what this applies to for, for, for the initial cross build or for. No, for native. As I said, uh, this is all native stuff. So I thought if a new um, platform uh, would allow, technically, by its CPU to run ex an existing architecture, then those packages could be satisfied, uh, could be used to satisfy dependencies and break build dependency cycles. So that might work, might be less useful in practice, but at least it's something that might be to be considered. Um, I developed several heuristics um, to find those source packages to modify, and uh, heuristics are needed and cannot be replaced by an automatism because um, all this work can only be done by a human, only humans are able to code and to analyze software, and machines can't yet, so this is all heuristical work. And, um, it only uses, like, mostly uses the dependency graph syntax, so it's mostly ignoring the semantics of dependencies, but it turns out that doing that um, already works surprisingly well, um, just taking the syntax of the graph and not the meaning of the uh, packages. I developed several kind of heuristics, simple ones, component-based ones, cycle-based ones, and in the end, the uh, feedback arc set algorithm, and we'll shortly introduce those now. Um, this is um, the output of bot. Um, it can be uh, looked at in this URL. Um, I generated the last one just today. So um, this website is the output of bot showing all results of all heuristics and outputs, showing all kind of dependency cycles, all heuristic results, and so on and so forth in a huge HTML page, which requires JavaScript to be pretty, so like having these um, page tables and stuff like that. But without JavaScript, you will also be able to see it and will just be bigger. Sure. Um, so this table, for example, um, is a table of edges with most cycles through them. Um, I will explain that a bit later, but um, you see an edge defined as a source package depending on, built depending on a binary package. And apparently there are 595 cycles through that, which means if you would be able to build libgcrypt11 without that, already 600 cycles would be broken. That's the idea. So simple heuristics, um, there are ratio-based heuristics. For example, you say, if I could build source evolution without libmx, then I would easily lose the connection to 55 other source packages. Or if I could um, build source tracker without dia, then I would lose the connection to those 22. Um, another one uh, just gives you the amount of missing dependencies. So um, if, in, if you uh, look in the graph and you see source packages which only have one build dependency missing, 
you might just say, well, that's an easy one, and um, drop that one and build it. Another thing is what we call weak dependencies, which are a set of, well, um, user-picked dependencies which are commonly used for documentation generation, which is, of course, also only heuristic and not always true. Um, another thing is strong bridges. If we take this graph, then a strong bridge would, for example, be this red edge. If we remove it, it would split, uh, split the graph into more strongly connected components, which would look like this. It's all done automatically for you, so you don't need to look at this graph and um, search for this red thing, because you get it in these HTML pages I showed before. Or strong articulation points, which is not the edge, but uh, a vertex. And once you remove this five, it is split in more strongly connected components, which are then easier to analyze. You can identify small cycles, um, which is particularly useful because uh, self-cycles um, have only one way to be split. For example, here we see that um, uh, udev build depends on usb um, utils. And of course, this cycle here, this two cycle, can only be broken by removing this um, build dependency because you can't break the binary dependency of usb utils on something that a source udev builds. Um, and as a matter of fact, for this graph, it even solves the whole graph to remove that one. So the first thing you want to do is to look at all these small cycles, which um, leads to another uh, thing I generate, but this time for all architectures, uh, which can be accessed using that URL up there, uh, which are dependency cycles, which are sometimes non-obvious self-cycles. Um, the type 2 is the type which is non-obvious. Type 1 is all those self-cycles of source packages which build depend on packages they build. So that's really easy to identify. You just um, uh, search through all source packages and see if any binary packages they build is in their build depends line. Type 2 is more hard. Um, it uses the concept of strong dependencies. Um, you can read, like it's a dependency which is non-optional even though um, uh, disjunctions might be involved. So it is probably uh, not very intuitive to know that um, package config uh, the source package package config can't be built because of lib glib 2 minus def. Or um, that uh, lib x11 can't be built because it depends on grof. Which kinda, even though it's in a self cycle, so there's no other way to split it except for really building lib x11 without grof, short of, of course, cross compiling things. Uh, why didn't you build the documentation? Right, exactly. So if grof was. Um, well, it, as it probably is for documentation generation, you would put it in build depends in depth, then hooray, this cycle is solved. Yes, um, another thing which, um, well, we already mentioned before is um, edges with most cycles through them. It is probably hard to see that uh, for this tiny graph with only 15 vertices, in contrast to the big graph with 1,000 vertices, for this tiny graph, there is one edge of all of these 31, which, if removed, makes this thing acyclic. It's hard for a human to see that, so the heuristic of edges with most cycles through them is used to identify that, indeed, um, this edge here has many cycles through them, and removing it, indeed, makes the whole thing acyclic. Yes? So again, um, well, adding yet now some, some meta information, um, this is used for testing, and, and, well, marking this kind of dependency as a test dependency, which is not necessarily used for, for the build would be very useful. Again? Um, so what do you mean by test dependency? So uh, Python uh, just built depends on XORs yes. to run uh, the decay tests. Ah, right, yes. So if that would be recorded somewhere, then it could easily be solved. An algorithm could then say, well, we can easily split that there. But that's a very good example of why humans are much better at this, right? Because you actually know what that dependency is for, whereas Jonas uh, has no idea. <laughs> yes, 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 but... but uh, yeah. And as you say, if we, if we put profiles on yeah. them, then it becomes... Uh, right, good. Yeah, so uh, good to know that that works out easily. Um, yes, another thing is um, calculating a feedback arc set. Feedback arc set is um, the set of edges which, if removed from the graph, makes it acyclic. And we want a small feedback arc set because we want to modify um, little. And um, I tested it with Debian SID as of today. At, um, well, that's from the uh, Debian snapshot. The graph has 28,000 vertices and a quarter million edges. And the biggest 
strongly connected component has a thousand vertices, as we saw before. And assuming everything can be broken, um, all of Debian can be bootstrapped by just modifying 51 source packages, which is, of course, a very, optim uh, a very optimistic um, assumption. So we used a more realistic data, which um, I got from Gentoo by analyzing use um, flags and uh, manual lists by crossing Glaser, Patrick McDermott, Daniel Schepler, and Wookie um, to get a more real list of what is actually breakable and came up with the, um, the number of 57 source packages. Might still be bigger, but it's probably in that ballpark in the end. The of the packages right now? Uh, right now yeah, sure, of course. Um, it is, it is also on the website, so if you go back to, this, um, to the website, uh, mismuffin.de slash bootstrap slash stats, then you will also see the list of packages which this algorithm suggests. Uh, well, not only packages, but also the build dependencies that would have to be dropped to achieve that. Right. Which of those is it? Uh, it is... set, only weak and It's not that one. I uh, know it is that one. Yes, it is that one. Mr. Muffin. De yeah. slash bootstrap slash stats. There's, there's a table of contents, and I was wondering which of these various things was the set of fifty-seven packages. So, because <laughs> they're all called things like strong articulation points and ratio binary heuristic. Um, it's like it's written by a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Feedback offset. There it is. Feedback offset. Right. So you would just disable, like, uncheck the other things, and then you are left with only that one. If so it's, it's a bootstrap uh, slash that stats. That. Right, yeah, the website um, contains loads of things, which is why um, there are these checkboxes check boxes on the top to just disable what you don't like. Um, and for example, look at the feedback arc set. Um, the feedback arc set is um, calculated using, like it's not complete, because, of course, we can't assume that the data we got from Gen2 is correct or the data that we provided is correct, so it's still only a suggestion. Okay, we were there. Yes, so 57, maybe a little bit more, but there is nothing more I can say right now because we only did the thing in theory and until we do them practice, we don't know how big of a difference the real number will be. At least theoretically, it is in that area. Right, uh, we also, uh, also want to show that um, the thing is relatively fast. So um, the blue part here is the calculation of a subset of Debian, which is smaller but includes the problem, like the big strongly connected component, which we actually care about. But once you reduce Debian to that, all the algorithms, of course, get much faster because they have to work on less packages. So if you reduce it, then even including the reduction, you get to overall 60 seconds of execution time for the algorithm. And if you're a developer and initially you care about this big blob, then you only run the blue stuff once and you only run repeatedly the green and red parts, which only take a few seconds together. And the thing gets longer if you use full Debian, and they get even longer if you calculate strong dependencies, which is, again, something that you have to probably, well, I can explain to you later. Um, but it is important to generate the HTML page I um, showed earlier to get all the information from there. It takes a bit longer, but you don't have, well, of course, you don't have to generate that every now and then. What you, uh, you don't have to generate that always. What you care, care about is the green and red part here as somebody who would use that tool to figure out what to modify. And that's only a few seconds. You would use this big thing probably as a daily um, um, built somehow that uh, updates the website, which is not done yet, so there will be some time until it's updated next. Uh, but it only takes six minutes again, so even doing it for all architectures will not be considerably long. Right, resources are here. Um, first of all, the slides can be downloaded from there, so you don't need to type that all down, but just to know where to get the slides from. Um, yeah, and then the rest. There's um, my blog, where I occasionally write about this kind of stuff. The mailing list, um, which we had, well, because it also cross mailing list was missing. Our IRC, IRC channel, um, Git repositories with the uh, software, um, those are three. The wiki pages. The to do page is uh, specifically of interest because it lists lots of things that uh, need to be done for this to be um, 
possible in practice. I could list all these things like build profiles and so on. Uh, my thesis for, well, a really in-depth in explanation of all that, um, and the threat about build profiles um, on Debian Devil. Right, so conclusion, um, we could have easier porting, more custom ports, remove the need of get to open embedded and other stuff, but we're missing the decision on build profile format and we're missing several fixes to support cross compilation better. Um, so with this talk I wanted to convince you that by having all these algorithms in place, um, we are good to go to um, do all the needed plumbing to actually have that working in practice at some point. Right, questions? Good, yeah. That means everybody understood everything except for Doko. <laughs> well, um, the, th the thing is that, that um, well, I was involved with, with Wookie in, and in the bootstrap of new architecture, did continue that, and it's, it's funny to see uh, some recommendations here. Um, for example, to break the cycle, um, building ECJ, uh, uh, dropping GCJ, right. um, um, and, and things like that. Yes, of course, you um, can't always do that, but uh, that is something that somehow has to be solved by one way or the other, because they depend on each other. Right. So what, what I would be more interested in um, is um, we, we know that, that, well, when I always see some, some dependencies on, on Tech Live, um, how can we make that uh, well, some some automatic uh, recommendations to avoid or to break these cycles in the first place in the packaging? So, um, in that, um, well, you don't need the documentation for for bootstrap build, right? And, and things like that. So that's nearly always build depends in depth, isn't it? It's just Unfortunately not. no, okay, because. Because of bad bad pa uh, packaging practices. So 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 what 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 I do do see well, um, packages with with packaging from the Stone Age um, do just um, um, have these uh, built um, um, dependencies um, encoded for 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 every build, and I think um, it is not clear um, or we don't have any recipes for. Um, uh, configuring uh, an arch um, only built uh, without documentation and an arch um, all built uh, with documentation. So how to propagate the configure flags uh, from the built arch and built built in-app targets down uh, to the configure step. So it, it can be done, but I think it's not obvious and, and, and many maintainers are not aware of that. So for many years we proposed having a, a, a Dead build options, no docs, for example, which would just nobble that throughout the build. And but that would not yeah. help the um, dependency resolution because it would still need the build profile for that. Yes, that's right. So I mean, exactly. now we have a mechanism to do that, which would be more kind of would be exposed to the, the anal analytical tools. Um, but yeah, it still requires package modification to actually make it work. Maybe uh, the bright side is that those packages which are needed to be changed are core packages more than leaf packages. So they are like the most majority, like in the um, big 1,000 uh, um, vertex dependency graph, which has to be solved, um, there are 1,000 vertices, as I said. But out of those 1,000, only three, so there are 360 source packages in there. So in the very worst case, um, well, you remember the number of 50 something. In the very worst case, you would have to modify 360. It doesn't go more than that, because once you modified all of them, it's all solved. Um, and those 360 are well-known packages, so you would also, for other reasons, be interested to have them maintained and properly well done. So that's maybe a plus because we don't care there about all these leaf thingies. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I think it's all cool, uh, really great work. And uh, I was uh, kind of looking for Perl to see Perl there, but uh, I suppose you're excluding the essential set or something like that, or build essential? I think Perl is part of the build essential. Oh, yeah. So yes, um, one assumption was to not only have as the, sm as the, avail as the available subset um, essential and build essential, but also dep helper. And I think dep helper pulls in Perl, right? Yes, and um, because 
73% of the archive depends on dev helpers, so it would be hard to bootstrap it natively rather than cross-compile a bit more and then have dev, dev, then have dev helper and some other things available. Hello. Uh, thank you for this presentation. It's an interesting work. Um, I, I have just one remark or maybe one question for you. Do you think that it's possible to have um, I mean, better results or to enhance more of the heuristics using a labeled graph. For example, a putting what? using a labeled graph for dependencies. Labeled I mean, the how? Type, the, uh, I mean, the name of the dependency or like labeling the dependencies by type to know what? which, I mean, if there is strong dependency or... Yes, uh, that exists. Ah, okay. So um, <laughs> the graph is labeled with several um, properties. Um, for example, being strong or not strong, um, that only we have two graph types. It only makes sense for some, uh, for one of them, to have them labeled as strong or not strong. Mm -hmm. That is used to, for example, calculate the strong self cycles, which some of the tables display. Uh, what other labels would you have suggested? Uh, well, <laughs> I'm not a specialist, but I, I thought that maybe we could classify the dependencies by types, and then I would be happy if there was more that I could rely upon dependency-wise, like where I get would get more semantics, like meaning of what the dependency means. Yes, but that's not bad. the <laughs> annotations are missing. Like I build profiles would be what would annotate dependencies as meaning something. And that's not there yet. Okay. Because so you think it's it ga it's gonna be more helpful if you have these annotations and use the semantic uh, semantics with the syntaxic. Uh, they approach. are needed, and the heuristics are there to find which source packages to modify. And once this information is there and complete enough, um, then another algorithm can come and uh, develop a linear build order. Um, but of course, that needs this annotation, which has to be done by a human at some point. Okay. Well, thank you. So presumably, the the set of type one cycles is the set of things that's r fundamentally difficult. You know, that's no compilers that build with themselves. And yeah. Yes. In that case, yes, it is the also the easy to find type, which you could also find using something that's not complete graph thingy because it would, would just go through each package and uh, check if the binary package it builds is in the build dependency list. So it's the easy to find list, but probably hard to solve list because it's compilers depending on themselves and stuff like that. Yes. I think we care about Haskell a bit. Yeah, um, if there are uh, any questions or if you have any suggestions on how to improve that, I would be very happy to hear from you um, because I'm only doing the theory stuff. I'm not actually bootstrapping or cross-putting anything. Yeah, so the next part of this is uh, like if anyone wants to go around and actually fix any of this stuff. So we have a student who is um, endeavoring to do some work, but he's actually mostly building scripts to help the actual process of building stuff and uploading stuff. Um, uh, so yes, anything which is in this list and you feel like breaking connections, then uh, that will be handy. Um, and we could make our, our set a bit more linear if anyone gets enthused. Because uh, it's only 57 packages in theory. Uh, <laughs> yes, but, but the it problem might be is... 360, it's somewhere in between those two numbers. Yes, unfortunately the problem is nobody can implement anything yet besides um, comments in their packaging because yeah. we have no decision on the no, syntax we yet. We <laughs> So, so, so I only think um, you can do s two things. The first one is to split out the documentation built into its own binary packages, um, architecture all, so you, th so you can move the build dependencies into uh, the independent build dependencies. Um, the second thing is to, to document the, the test uh, dependencies, uh, which packages are only needed to, to run the tests. And I think you, you will have to do that work um, anyway. And uh, I, I, I already see that, that many, uh, or some packages at least, have um, sorted their build dependencies into sections with comments in between, um, saying, well, these are build, uh, needed for that um, subset. Um, these are yeah, needed for the documentation. Yeah, that is, of course, most helpful. Right, and, and, and that makes really s sense to, to, to do that. 
Yeah, and as I said, uh, going to that website, I think even the, yeah, also the, if I remember correctly, even the list of what is what source packages are included in the hard, big, strong external component, the list is available, so you can always check if your package is in there and yeah. if you would like to at least comment something in your code. Yeah, for the purposes of, of you know, moving this forward, comments in the build depends thing is nearly as good as the actual build profile syntax we'll get to one day. You know, if, if someone works out what it is and writes it down in comments, it's a very simple problem to come along afterwards. Whereas, uh, you know, and, and a maintainer can do that, right? Whereas a random person goes, I have no idea what this is and I don't know what any of these build dependencies for and it'd be hard to work out. So, so writing down comments, I'm talking to the internet now, just so that you all know. Uh, comments in your build dependencies saying what they're for is really, really useful. Uh, and there will be some syntax along very shortly uh, and some mechanism to make that all automated more lovely. Is there any plan on the build profile stuff to have uh, information given to the rules file that says which profile is being used? I'm thinking of uh, GCC that you want to bootstrap where you can do the stage one thing and if, you if your rules file will be different if you're doing the stage one. Uh, or you do different things? Well, so where a profile exists uh, as declared by a package, then you can use it during the build to do stuff. Uh, and that's kind of domain-specific knowledge. I mean, at the moment, we, we basically decreed that there are three profiles, stage one, stage two, and cross, because that's the only things we've thought of use. And test, sorry. Uh, would I think the set, sorry? It would be variable that you query in your rules file and then do the right thing. So, I mean, it will always be domain specific. That, that, that any tool that does this has to have some kind of knowledge. So, so we define labels for purposes, uh, and then we use them. Uh, did that answer your question? Just yeah, you yeah. Because the other, the other possibility was just that, uh, you, uh, like, uh, S build would uh, be able to drop stuff if you if it knew you were doing a certain profile, and then you'd have to figure out in the rules file what was actually installed and behave appropriately, but yeah. <laughs> hmm? What is really missing is uh, a way to, to find these uh, packages which just support some kind of stage build. Currently you have to, to look at the rules file and you don't know, uh, well, here's something which could break a, de de um, a dependency cycle. Mm. And um, yeah, so I, I would like to, to um, see this kind informa of information in, in the control file. Um, so uh, supported uh, staged or op supported profiles or something like that. Yeah, so I think we're very close to actually having all that sorted. You know, we, have we had a demonstration, we've argued about it a bit. I think we've pretty much agreed a syntax. So uh, we just have to do the new implementation because we've changed it slightly and start using this mm, uh, maybe next month. Assuming, yeah, we've got to argue with dpackage people again, but it was, yep. <laughs> it was them that said change it. So hopefully we've pretty much changed it to what they asked for. So I think that should be okay now. Yeah, right. And we're done? Great.